Well, hey, thanks everyone for joining me. Again, this is Congressman Kai Kahele live streaming you on Facebook on Thursday night. It's seven o'clock in the evening. And I really appreciate all of you um, who have taken the time to jump on. Um, tonight, I'm going to give a federal update on a very important piece of legislation that was introduced in the United States House of Representatives um, about a month and a half ago. It is House Resolution 7130, uh, the Leandra Vi Act, uh, which addresses the Makua Valley um, military training ranges and the return of Makua Valley back to the state of Hawaii. Um, I'm going, I have a PowerPoint presentation that, I, that I'm gonna show. Uh, my staff in Washington, DC, I gotta say thank you so much to them and our hardworking interns that put together this comprehensive uh, presentation um, that gives you an opportunity to learn about the issue about Makua Valley, its history, um, where we are today, and what the future looks like for Makua Valley. So I am going to share this presentation. I'll run through the slides, uh, narrate it as well. And then at the end of it, if you have any questions, just post your questions in the chat and I'm happy to uh, answer them. So I'm gonna jump in, give me one second, and I'm gonna turn off my video and share my screen. And please let me know if you see the presentation. Uh, if you see the presentation and you should see the first slide, the Makua Valley slide, please let me know. And then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I, I can't see any other comments right now. So my staff in Washington DC, who's on this at one o'clock in the morning, go ahead and stop me if um, I'm going um, too fast and you can't see the slide. So right now you should all be seeing a beautiful picture of Makua Valley. Uh, this is from uh, the access road when you first enter Makua um, and looking back towards the beautiful expanse of Makua Valley. Okay, Makua Valley, um, for those of you uh, who are, uh, are interested in learning more about its history and its name, uh, Makua is important in the native Hawaiian mo'olelo or storytelling because it uh, means parent in Hawaiian. So Makua means parent and it's rich in cultural resources, uh, Makua Valley, given its location, is a very, very expansive cultural landscape and has a lot of interrelated uh, sites. There is tons of evidence in Makua Valley of extensive agricultural terracing, uh, access to important offshore fisheries in Makua Bay. So, you know, when you look at uh, the native Hawaiian ahupua'a um, system or the native Hawaiian um, how they structured the uh, Mauka to Makai, um, you know, native Hawaiian village or communal type of living. This is a great example of what has existed throughout the Hawaiian islands where you have the ocean, you have a beach, and it goes all the way through the valley, all the way back to the um, uh, forest areas and the watersheds uh, in the back of the valley. And so, Makua had been populated for uh, hundreds, if not a thousand years prior to um, uh, 
of course, World War II, and, and it had been occupied by Native Hawaiians for quite some time. The Makua Military Reservation contains uh, numerous temples, shrines, petroglyphs, and other sacred sites, uh, which are in Makua Valley. And Makua lies, for those of you that you know, drive out to the Leeward Coast, go out to uh, Kaena and Kaena Beach and Kaena Point, you drive right past uh, Makua on Farrington Highway. It's a beautiful beach. It's been used by local families for recreation, for fishing and gathering. Uh, but it is also a very important site for Native Hawaiian cultural practices and is a educational resource for culture and history and ecology. Makua is home to 41 endangered species of plants and animals uh, in or near the valley. And in total, Makua Valley, at least what is considered part of the Makua Military Reservation, is about 4,190 acres of land. Uh, this is where Makua is located. So, you know, once you pass Kapole on Farrington and you're headed out towards Kaena, past Nanakuli, past Waianae, past Makaha, uh, past Pokai Bay, uh, and there's a big cave, uh, and you just keep driving out and you will pass Makua Valley and Makua Beach. Uh, now, the history of Makua um, really began uh, before World War II but dramatically changed uh, shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, the military needing training ranges uh, throughout the Hawaiian Islands um, decided that Makua was a premier training site and one that the military wanted to train in. Now, you know, if, if you uh, are or are not aware, during World War II, we did not have a uh, territorial governor of Hawaii during the time. The uh, governor of Hawaii, who was in charge of Hawaii after December 7, 1941, was the military, led by the highest ranking uh, military service member in Hawaii at the time, while Hawaii was under martial law. So if you would compare it to today, the highest ranking military uh, member is the Indo-PACOM commander, the Indo-Pacific Command commander, that's Admiral Aguilino. So whoever was that person back in 1941 was the basically the, under martial law, the commander of the armed forces in Hawaii and also the governor, the territorial governor, I guess you could say, of Hawaii or uh, in his place during that time. And through that process, they uh, imposed martial law and evicted families that had been living at Makua for generations, uh, destroyed homes and infrastructure through training exercises. Now, the military promised to return Makua back to the families that were evicted and the people that lived there six months after the end of World War II, um, but that promise uh, was not kept, and Makua Military Reservation is still occupied by the United States Army to today. Uh, there also existed Kuleana land grants in Makua, and those were seized as well, in addition to Hawaiian trust lands. Uh, the Kuleana Act, which had provided land for Native Hawaiians uh, to hold title and have these Kuleana awards, uh, those were taken away from those families that live there. Um, the armed forces, the military, they have not conducted any live fire training at Makua Military Reservation since June of 2004. And that was part of a concerted effort led by, um, you know, protectors of Makua, people like Bill Isla, um, Earth Justice, who was a was a, a big part of that late 1990s, early 2000s um, legal interventions with the army um, that seized all training at Makua, um, and they have not done any live fire training there since June of 2004. Uh, for over 23 years, military units have consistently and repeatedly been able to achieve combat readiness without conducting any live fire training at Makua Military Reservation. And that's something important. You know, we went to war about a month after 9-11 when we went into Afghanistan. And, um, you know, that was a almost 20-year war. 
Um, and we have not trained military units at Makua Military Reservation since June of 2004 throughout the entire Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Okay, let's talk about land here. Uh, land is really important in the MMR, and I'm just going to refer to the Makua Military Reservation as the MMR. So of the Army controlled land or the total controlled land within MMR, uh, there are 4,190 acres. And of that 4,190 acres, 782 of those acres are, are land that are uh, held in title by the state of Hawaii and are currently leased to the United States Army. So of the 4,192 acres, or 4,190, 782 acres is state land in Makua Military Reservation. Um, the Army's presence dates back, like I said, before World War II to the 1920s when they installed gun emplacements. Um, during World War II, uh, 3,236 acres were ceded um, by the Army, basically taken under military occupation, and 170 of them were uh, apparently purchased. The lease agreement between the state of Hawaii and the Army was agreed to in 1964 for 65 years, meaning the lease will end in 2029. Now, this is an interesting uh, um, fact uh, or a, a, a learning point here is why 1964 and why this 782 acres? When Hawaii became a state in 1959, and the United States of America admitted the territory of Hawaii into the Union as part of the Admissions Act, um, there were certain agreements made between the United States and the territory of Hawaii and what would then become the state of Hawaii. A lot of lands that were taken from uh, the territory during military occupation um, were being negotiated to be returned or not returned to the new state. And the military decided to keep certain lands and they decided not to keep certain lands. Well, as part of that Admissions Act, the, the United States of America had five years after, after statehood to decide what lands they wanted to retain as federal lands and what lands they didn't wanna retain as federal lands and would instead lease from the state. So, 1964 comes along, five years after 1959, and the United States decides uh, all over the state of Hawaii uh, to lease, to give back to the state, and then in turn turn around and lease back certain lands uh, throughout the state. This 782 acres is that. The lands at Pohakoloa, same thing. So that's why they have all these 1964, 1965 timelines. Uh, they did one year, or excuse me, $1 a year leases for 65 years. And um, many of those leases will come to an end in 2029. So that's, that's where that comes from. You know, why the 1964 year? Why 65 years? Why 782 acres? Um, that's, that's the reason why. The Army has goals of renewing this lease when it comes to an, to an end. Uh, you know, Makua for, for decades has sparked anger in the Hawaiian communities, um, has created a lot of anxiety and stress with our kupuna and the native Hawaiian communities along the leeward coast um, that have led to many community initiatives with goals of giving Makua back to the state of Hawaii. Um, the Army has been reluctant to adhere to some of the Kuleana land grants. Um, and so that has also complicated the situation. Uh, also, when the Army wants to pursue a new lease for Makua, they're required to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969 and the Hawaii Environmental Policy Act, which was mirrored after NEPA. And so what that requires the Army to do is to prepare an environmental impact statement or an EIS. Uh, and so the Army has begun to do that. They issued a notice of intent in 2021 to prepare an EIS. 
And part of that EIS is to look at and address many different things, both archeological, ecological, but also the Army's long-term retention of the land and how that would affect um, the surrounding area. But that is what the Army is doing uh, right now. To get a good like overall picture of it, you guys remember the original picture looking to the back of the valley? So everything that the uh, Army has in green is all ceded land. So that was land that was taken during occupation or ceded to the United States and, and never returned. You have the fee simple uh, properties, which are in yellow. Um, you can see many of those properties cross over Farrington Highway. Uh, these were those Kuleana uh, properties that were taken as well. And then you have the lease lands. And so a lot of the lease land areas are in the front of the valley. And that is what the uh, military would like to renew their lease and get a new lease. And that total is about 782 acres. That is owned by the state of Hawaii. Uh, live fire trainings have uh, inflicted damage on Makua's cultural sites. Um, you know, when the military did training, they parked, you know, warships offshore and fired uh, artillery and munitions into Makua Valley. Uh, airplanes came in from the ocean and did strafing runs, all kinds of stuff. I mean, there are, uh, there was a church there that was strafed. There were uh, headstones in the graveyard that still have bullet holes in them today. Uh, and so the live fire trainings that con were conducted at Makua for, for years uh, inflicted a lot of damage on its cultural sites uh, and, you know, the uh, archeological sites in Makua. Uh, continued military occupation of Makua limits access by Native Hawaiian cultural practitioners. Right now, there are, uh, I believe, two cultural access days a month. Uh, they're usually held on Saturdays. I actually went to one uh, with the Malama Makua Ohana uh, in January of this year. Uh, late January, I went on a Saturday cultural access day. I went with, um, uh, Rep. Amy uh, Peruso came uh, from Wahiwa, and Kalehua Krug came, and the Malama Makua Ohana, and representatives from the United States Army uh, joined us as well. And anyone can go on these culture access days. Uh, you just have to coordinate with Malama Makua, but it does give you a chance on one of those two Saturdays a month to get to experience Makua and the protocols there and the cultural significance of the area. Um, military fires at MMR threaten over 40 species of animals and plants protected under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the military has had uh, instances of controlled brush fires that have quickly spiraled out of control in 1995. Uh, 2,600 acres of the uh, 4190 acre reservation were charred. And back in 2003, a planned 900 acre controlled burn turned into a over 2,100 acre blaze. Uh, toxins from military training uh, continue to potentially contaminate Makua's air, land, and water. And it's many of those uh, contaminants are transported to civilian areas like the beach. And there has been um, uh, unexploded ordnance and remnants of live fire training that have appeared on the beach uh, uh, on many, many different occasions um, because of, you know, sand and the tides. And so that's something that the military has had to send representatives out to do, to do uh, uh, detonate some kind of detonation or making sure that that um, uh, munition was safe and, and secure and properly disposed of. Um, currently, uh, Makua, it doesn't have any live fire training in it, but it is used for air assault training or ground training. They do unmanned aerial system training in there as well. And Makua is used by units of the Army, the Marine Corps, and the reserves. There are a number of archeological sites in Makua. Uh, 16 of over 100 recogni recognized archeological sites are in the MMR. Some of the very significant ones that are there are um, Ukanipo Heao, Ka'ahihi Heao, 
uh, there's a core fishing shrine. Um, there's, there's significant archeological sites there that document a uh, traditional Hawaiian uh, agriculture and, and families uh, that live there. And so those archeological sites you know, are protected by both state and federal laws and um, uh, you know, must be factored in when the army is doing their environmental impact study. Previous land issues with the army have made many nervous about what could happen to the land should it remain with the army for an even longer term. Uh, we have some examples of that. The Waikoloa FUD site, they call it formerly used defense site or the Waikoloa maneuver area is where the military did extensive live fire training uh, back in uh, the 1940s. Uh, there was a cleanup effort that detected just a ton of munitions and explosives, many of them unexploded ordnance, um, which included hand grenades, all kinds of stuff that still existed in the Waikoloa uh, FUD site. And still to today, there are cleanup uh, efforts um, in the Waikoloa FUD site. I know there are some NHOs, some Native Hawaiian organizations that are doing some of that work, but it's an extensive uh, operation to clean up those areas. Of course, Kaho'olawe uh, is um, also an island that required extensive cleanup. Uh, the Navy used Kaho'olawe and it's approximately 45 square miles for target practice from World War II until 1990. Um, in 98, the federal government set aside $400 million to clean up Kaho'olawe. And uh, by 2004, all of that funding was expended but only 75% of the island surface was, was clean. And I'm not even sure if that's accurate. I know there's, I haven't even actually been to Kaolavi myself, but I know there's still many areas of the island that, that you cannot go to because it has not been cleaned up. Um, in addition, recent events at Red Hill have also furthered the desire to put Mako back into the hands of the state. And uh, there's apprehension that surrounds areas uh, from known unexploded ordinances being present in the area. Uh, and of course, more army trainings or control of the area can continue this trend of UXO presence. And when we went on the January cultural access visit, you know, we had to go with a guide who had to clear the area that we walked in to make sure that there was no unexploded ordinance that was, um, had, had not been uh, remediated in the front half of the valley where we spent most of our time. So now we jump to House Resolution 7130. You can go to congress.gov uh, to pull this bill up. You just type in HR 7130. Uh, this bill was introduced in March of 2022, uh, where I introduced it in the House of Representatives. It's the first time a sitting member of the delegation had taken a clear position on the return of Makua Valley and had actually introduced a piece of legislation to do exactly that. After I went to the cultural access um, visit and having been to Makua on at least two other previous visits uh, with the US Army, um, you know, I felt that it was time for Makua to be returned to the state and that the continued and ongoing negotiation process to lease Makua uh, was something that um, our Leeward Coast community should not be put through again. Uh, Makua Valley is not needed for training by the United States military, and it is time to return Makua Valley back to the state of Hawaii and to clean it up and to restore it to what it was like before uh, the military occupied Makua back in uh, 1941. So right now, the bill is introduced in the House. It has been referred to several committees, but the main committee that this bill would um, uh, be assigned to or be uh, heard in would be the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, should the House Armed Services Committee or its various subcommittees decide to have a hearing on this bill, uh, they would then move this bill to a markup uh, where then any member on the House Armed Services Committee could offer an amendment to amend this bill. Uh, once the bill is marked up in committee, 
the bill would then go to the floor of the U.S. House, um, where then it would be uh, open for debate again, and any member of the U.S. House could add an amendment to this bill if they had the votes to um, incorporate it into the bill or take out something in the bill that a member wanted out. But once the bill was uh, in its final form, it would take a simple majority to pass this bill in the House, so 218 votes, and then the bill would then advance to the United States Senate for further deliberation. In the Leandro Vi Act um, outlines specific steps to return Makua Valley to the state of Hawaii. First of all, the bill's namesake, Leandra Vai, who served as president of Malama Makua until she passed in 2016, twice per month from 2002 until her passing, Leandra led cultural access into Makua Valley. And she facilitated the cultural reconnection of thousands of community members uh, that uh, would come from all over the island and all over the state to reconnect themselves to Makua, especially the lineal descendants from the Leeward Coast, from the Waianae Coast. Um, so we decided because of her tremendous impact and uh, you know early pioneering effort to return Makua back to the people of Hawaii, that it was fitting uh, to name the bill after her. And uh, the Malama Makua Ohana um, helped us gain um, support from her family to do that. Uh, this legislation specifically calls for a few things. The first thing it does is it directs the DOD to do a cost estimate for land remediation and restoration required for ag, residential, or human habitation. So the first thing is we need to know how much it's going to cost to remediate and restore this land back to the point where if it ever um, was needed to be, could be returned for human habitation. Um, and so that, uh, of course, and agricultural use and residential use as well. Uh, the, the second thing is we would convey the MMR to the state of Hawaii under what they call CERCLA, or the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. That's a federal piece, uh, it's a federal law. Um, meaning the DOD would remain responsible for future discoveries of UXOs. This is important because if there's anything that's found that was not remediated, something washes up on the beach, um, uh, something gets unearthed after the military says, hey, we've cleaned everything up, it's good to go, they would still be responsible for that UXO uh, discovery and future remediation. Um, the federal government would enter into a memorandum of understanding with the state. It would establish a trust fund. Um, whatever that cost estimate determined would cost for remediation and restoration. Those monies would go into this trust fund. And the bill also directs the Secretary of the Army to consult with Native Hawaiian organizations or NHOs on the timing, planning, methodology, and implementation for the removal of the UXO and any other contaminants. So we wanted to make sure that if there were federal funds coming to the state of Hawaii uh, for the remediation of Makua Valley, which is gonna probably cost a lot of money and be an extensive remediation um, operation over uh, um, uh, you know, multi-year period, that we wanted to make sure Native Hawaiian organizations, NHOs, Native Hawaiian small businesses and Hawaii businesses would be a, a part of those federal contracts, at least considered for those federal contracts, rather than bringing in a company from the mainland. Uh, the Leandro Vi Act also intends for additional results, um, environmental justice and terminating the US military occupation and usage of MMR. Um, you know, why not is, uh, and its entire district is home to the largest concentration of native Hawaiians in the state. Yet nearly one third of Waianae's land is occupied by the US military, whether it's Makua Valley, Lua Lua Lei, um, there's a significant amount of military presence on the Leeward Coast. Um, for years, the community has been burdened with threats to health, safety, the environment, fires, 
And by returning MMR to the state of Hawaii uh, within 180 days, um, it would accomplish the first step of returning Makua to the state, but it would keep the DOD responsible for costs associated with that removal. Um, the required timeline, if this bill becomes law and the uh, federal government is required to return Makua to the state within six months, is intended to put pressure on the Department of Defense to act quickly um, to provide that cost estimate and the initial scoping of what remediation would look like to deem the entire valley safe. Um, within one year after enactment, the Department of Defense will need to report and brief on UXO cleanup studies to Congress. Uh, and by doing all of these things, it potentially revives Makua's potential for agricultural, residential, or even economic type of growth. Uh, now, while remediation is ongoing, uh, we did not want to prevent or stop the two uh, twice a month cultural access that currently is, is um, ongoing as of right now. And so the legislation preserves the right for cultural access to MMR, um, which was part of the 2001 settlement agreement. Um, Makua is very important for the revitalization of Native Hawaiian cultural practices and is a valuable educational resource for our culture, our history, and our ecology. There are some uh, very active. These are not all of them. There are others on the Leeward Coast as well that are very active with Makua. Um, but one of the main groups is Malama Makua, which is a Native Hawaiian-led nonprofit with a mission to bring about the return of Makua from the U.S. military back to the state of Hawaii or a uh, entity represented by the Native Hawaiians um, for culturally appropriate use. Another very important organization is Earth Justice, um, who has been uh, working along with the community on this issue for, you know, almost 20 to 25 years, uh, and they were the organization that won landmark victories against the United States Army in court. And these are some of those notable victories. Um, uh, required the US Army to do a EIS for live fire training, um, uh, upheld the ruling to enforce the Army to provide cultural access and safely clear the UXOs, especially in the front of Makua Valley. Um, and a lot of the legal challenges uh, or suing for cultural access rights um, have been ongoing for decades. So what are some of the next steps? Um, if approved by Congress and signed by the president into law, um, like I just briefed earlier, the bill would require the Department of Defense to return Makua within 180 days or six months. It requires the DOD to be responsible for any type of ongoing and future UXO removal costs. And in terms of legislative strategy, um, besides this bill that I introduced, House Resolution 7130, a, another, um, another legislative strategy to uh, accomplish uh, the Leandro Vi Act and the um, components of the act would be for uh, me to advocate for including this legislation as a provision in the upcoming National Defense Authorization Act. And so um, I intend to, as a member of the House Armed Services Committee, uh, intend to offer an amendment to probably the chairman's mark of the NDAA that will include provisions that are in the Leandro Vi Act. So uh, we will have two potential mechanisms to return Makua Valley back to the, the state of Hawaii during the 117 Congress. First one is this bill. Second one is a offer an amendment in committee to see if I can get it into the larger NDAA. That will require a majority um, of the members on the House Armed Services Committee to support my amendment. And we'll be working on that um, uh, with other members of the House Armed Services Committee to educate them on Makua Valley, to give them this presentation as well, and to convey to them why um, this is so important 
for the people of Hawaii that we, we finally return Makua and stop the lease process or the, 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 the lease renewal negotiation process um, that I think is, is unnecessary. Uh, what can the Army do? Well, the, the Army continues to pursue um, a lease, a new lease. Uh, like I said earlier, this lease will expire in 2029. Uh, this is 2022. Um, the Army is doing its public scoping process. Uh, they chose to do their public scoping process last year during COVID, which never gave people the opportunity to have in-person public scoping and public hearings on their draft EIS. They did those via Zoom. And I strongly would encourage the United States Army to go to the Leeward community, um, you know, have co in-person community meetings, you know, and, and hear from the people of, of Oahu and the Leeward Coast about how they feel about a um, renewal of the Makua lease. Um, you know, the military does participate on both the Waianae and Nanakuli neighborhood boards every month. Um, I mahalo them for that. We're on them as well. And they field questions from the community all the time regarding this particular issue. But at the end of the day, that 782 acres that is owned by the state of Hawaii, uh, that is leased to the United States Army, uh, that lease, should it ever get that far, would have to go and be approved of by the Board of Land and Natural Resources, uh, which is the governing uh, board uh, that oversees the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So um, sometime between 2022 and 2029, um, if the Army continues to go down this path, uh, eventually this lease application would go in front of the BLNR, the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Those members uh, sit on a very important board, um, that oversees the DLNR and the chair and makes major decisions on land use, especially lands that are owned by the state and managed by the DLNR. Of course, the governor of the state of Hawaii appoints the members to the BLNR. And so Governor Ige just appointed a few new uh, land board members to the BLNR. So that's a very important board, especially uh, the future BLNR. And there's also the nuclear option that the um, United States and the federal government could also do, which would be condemnation uh, by the United States uh, military in regards to Makua. Um, I don't think that is a palatable position in our community. It would obviously be not one that I would support or um, I think any of the member members of the delegation would be very difficult to get them to support that. But that always is a possibility if um, the state and the US military are, are unable to come to an agreement on, on either the termination of that lease or the renewal of that lease, they could always condemn the land and take it in fee. Um, and I like to recur, refer to that as a nuclear option because I think that would be the worst decision that the uh, uh, military could make, especially in Hawaii in light of Red Hill and in light of um, other issues that the military has to deal with. But I am mentioning it because it is on the table and it has been spoken about um, in the past. Okay, I think that is that the last slide? That is the last slide. This is a, a picture of... Uh, on one of my visits to Makua. Um, we're standing in a pavilion there and we're looking up the road towards the back of the valley. If you get an opportunity to go, I would recommend you get a chance to go to Makua and participate in one of those Saturday cultural access days. You get there at like eight o'clock in the morning um, and you're done by like 12. And um, it was very meaningful for myself and my team to go and experience it and to hear from Malama Makua and the community a different perspective than I heard from the Army. Um, you know, many of the Army uh, employees there are, uh, you know, former military, 
they're civil service employees of the, the army. They're good people. Um, they mean well, um, and, and they're, they're doing the best job they can to, you know, manage the Makua military reservation, uh, you know, under the uh, challenges that they have right now. But the, the, the big decisions on the future of Makua are not made at their level. They're made at the Department of Defense, um, the Congress, the Pentagon. Those are those decisions that are made. So I do want to um, acknowledge the civil service employees that work really hard at Makua to um, do their best to preserve the cultural sites, to uh, preserve the cultural access for the community there. Um, because when I went, you know, I had a, I had a pretty good experience. Um, if you need any information uh, from our office, our office is always here to help you. You can always uh, email kahele.house.gov. Uh, or you can just call either of those numbers, Washington, D.C. Don't call now because it's 142 in the morning over there. But our Hilo office uh, is on Hawaii time, 746-6220. And our Washington, D.C. office uh, is they're all, also there most of the day as well. And um, even now, I know at least two of my Washington, D.C. team, my ledge director, Connor Smith and my comms director, Michael Ahn, are both up right now at 1.42 in the morning. So I really appreciate um, their, uh, their support. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn on my video. I'm going to go to Facebook and see if we have any questions. Do we have any questions? I don't even know where to look for questions. I see 18 people on. There are no questions? No questions, Kana? All right, wow, did a good job then. Okay, well, hey, um, thank you all for joining this uh, um, federal presentation on Makua Valley. I uh, really appreciate uh, those of you that decided to um, spend your 45 minutes with me on a Thursday night. I hope you learned a little bit about Makua Valley, its history, um, Currently, what uh, uh, we're dealing with with Makua and what the future of Makua Valley looks like. Again, if you have any questions, just email them uh, to our office. Um, but other than that, we ended up ending, ending early. Just checking. No questions, right, staff? No questions. All right. Well, hey, thank you guys so much. Have a great evening. Uh, I got to go see if the UH men's volleyball team beat Ball State. And uh, when I left, they had just lost the second set. So hopefully... Um, the game is still going or they've already won. But anyways, hope you have a great night, everyone, and have a great Aloha Friday tomorrow. And for all our mothers out there, happy Mother's Day this weekend. Aloha. <laughs>